However, there is one important group of people in Canada that do not enjoy the benefits of property, and that is uh, Indians, status Indians, First Nations, whatever you want to call them. Um, they, they don't have property in either the collective or the individual sense. The first point to make is that there's now, six, give or take, 640 First Nations uh, in Canada, and they, they have at their disposal about 3,100 uh, reserves, pieces of, of land that are set aside for their use and benefit. That number is growing rapidly. Ten years ago, when I published another book, it's back there at First Nations Second Thoughts, and you know, I hope you buy them all. Uh, there were only about 2,600 reserves. So we've added about another 500 Indian reserves in the last ten years, and that's as a result of settling claims, historic claims, to pieces of land are being allocated. But with very, very few exceptions, <clears throat> First Nations do not own the land on which they live. This is Crown land. It's, um, it's managed by the federal government under Section 9124 of the British North America Act, and in, in more detail under the Indian Act, which was passed by the Parliament of Canada under 9124, which gives the federal parliament control over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. So the Indian nations as communities don't own the land on which they live. That differentiates them from other communal type. There, I mean, there are other communal groups in Canada. Take the Hutterites, for example. So tens of thousands of people living in communal arrangements. But they own their own land. They buy sections of farmland and they live on it. So they, have, uh, uh, they, they don't uh, distribute the title to the individual members of the community, but the Hutterite community has a, has a title to all that land. But Indians don't have that. They are, they are tenants of the crown. So they don't own, uh, as communities, they don't own the land on which they live. And secondly, individuals, members of the reserves, don't have full-fledged, any kind of full-fledged individual property rights. There are, I would call them quasi-property rights uh, for individuals on reserves. And just to, just to hit it very briefly, uh, there's three types. There's customary rights, which are very common on reserves. Families have lived on certain pieces of reserve for generations, and uh, land is regarded as theirs, although the boundaries are often unclear. There are a lot of disputes with neighbors. And you cannot enforce customary rights in court. <clears throat> They're not mentioned in the Indian Act, and the courts won't won't enforce them. So if there's a dispute over land, it has to be settled by the band council. It turns into a political struggle. The second type of property is uh, called a certificate of possession. They're not very common in the prairies. They are quite common in Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, but not in the prairies. A certificate of, of uh, possession is something that's granted by the minister on the recommendation of the band council. It's like, sort of like, the ownership and fee simple that you have. Uh, it, it can be enforced in court. You can you have control over it. You can exclude other people from, from it. You can use it for your benefit. But you can't sell it or give it to anybody except another member of the same band. So there's almost no real estate market, even on reserves that are highly certificated, as some are. There are some reserves that actually were almost all the land is subdivided and there is a high level of home ownership based on that. But the homes can't be used as an investment vehicle the way that most of us do. Certainly for me, uh, our home is the, most, is the most valuable asset that we have. But that's because there's a market in which we can sell it. But if you're an Indian living on a reserve, uh, you know, your stories about nice houses being sold for twenty or $25,000 there's just, no, there's just no market. So generally speaking, uh, Indians who build houses never even think of selling them. They just think they'll keep them and then give them to their children or something like that. Um, and then there are leaseholds. The Indian Act provides for uh, land on reserves. Uh, it's possible to be leased. Again, it's complicated. It requires approval of the minister, which means the Department of Indian Affairs. Uh, but a, a lease is a marketable instrument. A 
uh, once a lease is drawn up, it can be sold to somebody else. So Redwood Meadows is based on leasehold. That's um, the uh, underlying title is still in the federal crown. It's still part of the Indian Reserve, but they set up 49-year leases. And those can be bought and sold, and they are, they are traded in the market. The only, not the only, but the main problem with leases is that by nature they're temporary. And what happens when uh, um, you get close to the renewal date, if you're not sure what the landlord is going to do, you might be faced with total collapse of value of your, uh, of your property. In fact, we're getting to that point in Redwood Meadows, uh, 49 year leases, they go back to the early 70s, some of them, so uh, it won't be that long until something has to be worked out. That's not your writing as well. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that. 